This is episode 23. I am going to be talking about Soren Kierkegaard's book called The Sickness Unto Death. I'm very new to Kierkegaard, um, so I'm not going to claim that I have them all figured out or anything. Um, part of me recording this is, um, as I started reading it, I just kept marking quotes that um, were striking to me, and um, I haven't even finished the book yet, and I do think either he kind of lost me towards the end of the book, or... Uh, I just didn't get it as much as I got it at the, at the beginning of this one. So, the first quote I'm going to read is not even from this book. It's um, So the quote is, Boredom is the root of all evil, the despairing refusal to be oneself. I think that quote comes from his diary or his journal, something like that. I think it's published, but maybe it's kind of hard to get a hold of. Um, but somebody tweeted it or something, and it's sort of stuck with me ever since. Um, I guess I would like to read that in its context, but you'll kind of see some of the parallels um, in what he's writing here. So, let's dig into it. The first quote is, The Christian heroism, and perhaps it is rarely to be seen, is to venture wholly to be oneself as an individual man, this definite individual man alone before the face of God, alone in the tremendous exertion and the this tremendous responsibility. I've talked in other videos about, like in my Peterson group, um, the how that group was a, a bit of an experiment in a mix between religious and non-religious people. Um, and I guess it's something I continue to be fascinated by. Because um, it seems like part of progress is going to be these two camps being able to collaborate without trying to convert each other. Um, I don't quite know how that works, but um, as someone who is a believer, getting across this notion of what that means, and then from the other side, attempting to understand um, how different someone's worldview is. Or, how different their outlook is on almost everything when they don't, when there isn't sort of a creator at the beginning or at the bottom or, uh, you know, um, as the source of all things. So this first quote is just simply, um, I think anybody who thinks seriously about their belief in God, I think, Maybe this is the bedrock thing that, or at least it's something you keep coming back to in life, is there's different types of people, and there's we're called for different roles in this world, whether or not there's a God. Obviously, we have talents, and we have things we're interested in, and um, but I say that to say that at 
it's almost made to say it's you're taking the easy route to just be part of a group or to just go along with what everyone else is doing, whether that be <clears throat> socially or religiously. Or, um, but the idea here is as you contemplate why you're here and what you're supposed to do while you're here, this idea of you're standing alone before your creator who made you, who gave you whatever talents you have, put you in the circumstance that you're in. And it is sort of this face-off of um, taking on the responsibility of all of those things. If you choose to accept them, obviously, if you don't believe in God or if you just, uh, you know, you don't want to look at the world this way at all, then you just um, can, can try not to think about anything like this. But it's a good exercise. Whether or not you believe in God, even if you are not really convinced, but it just is a thought experiment of if there were a creator who made you with all of the good and the bad that is in you and put you in the position that you're in and how you doing? Um, you know, the good book says there will be an account at some point. So and in a way, you're just sort of practicing for what is to come. But um, anyway. I'm just going to move on to the next quote. So it is that Christianity has taught the Christian to think dauntlessly of everything earthly and worldly, including death. It is almost as though the Christian must be puffed up because of his proud elevation above everything men commonly call misfortune, above that which men commonly call the greatest evil. So I think this could be a good thing and this could be a bad thing. Um, I think I've heard people like Sam Harris say that one of their problems with religious people is they don't take this world seriously enough. Like this is just the opening act and the, the good stuff is to come and so I guess I, I get that, but the good side of it is if there is a God, if there is, if we are eternal, if we are souls who will leave these earthly bodies at some point, maybe that's the not, not the right phrasing. Um, I guess some would say that these bodies are going to be remade or, you know, resurrected, just like Christ was resurrected. I, I grant that that could be. But the point is this is a mortal world. And if you accept this idea that we are actually immortal, then there could be a beneficial perspective that you get from that. Because if you're not so freaked out by death and all of the bad that you could, we are all going to suffer in this life. I mean, that's, we know that's what we're, that's part of the, um, Part that we, uh, part of the role that we play here. Part of the experience. But knowing that this is a finite part of something that is infinite, it actually does 
bring a little bit of levity or it helps us to it helps us to endure because we know we're going to endure even though we die there's something beyond that so the next quote is this formula i.e. that the self is con constituted by another is the expression for the total dependence of the relation the self namely the expression for the fact that the self cannot of itself attain and remain in equilibrium and rest by itself but only by relating itself to the that power which constituted the whole relation born into this world. Um, maybe you have no concept of who you are. Or maybe you come from a really strong family and in that family you have a strong identity and um, you have a good base. But you're still, at some point you're leaving that nest and you're going out into the world and you're figuring out who you are and you're figuring out what you can do for the world. and. What I read from this is this is the idea that you figuring out who you are, part of that process is it, it's a he uses the word the, 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 is the expression for the total dependence of the relation. So there's something about your relationship with your creator who is helping you discover who you are. I mean, it makes perfect sense from that angle. Um, the hard part is how do you commune? How do you? How are you communicating with your creator? Uh, what does that look like? something that it's easy to be very skeptical about. But making the assumption that a creator made you, of course, it's in that in how you relate to him that you're going to figure out who you are. And that part of it does sort of seem to be a mystery that why don't we know more? Why is it so hard to figure out who we are and what we're doing here? And um, that's part of the mystery of the whole thing. But the next quote is: "But the eternal he cannot get rid of. No, not to all eternity he cannot cast it from him once for all. Nothing is more impossible. Every instant he does not possess it, he must have it." have cast it or be casting it from him but it comes back every instant he is in despair he contracts it. every instant he is in despair he contracts despair so I see this in myself as a believer that there is sort of a burden um, with this idea of the eternal. We have eternity waiting for us, or we have eternity bearing down on us, and it feels like we're not even getting started. We're wallowing in mud while we're supposed to be moving towards something that is so um, much more than we can imagine and yet we're stuck in the muck but it's interesting from the as I said in the beginning in trying to communicate about an idea like this with somebody who doesn't believe that if your belief is that this earth is finite <clears throat> is it true that you cannot get rid of the eternal? 
is it really haunting you or do you not think about it at all? Um, I've been a believer my whole life, so I, it's always been something that's been there. But being able to I guess that's just a question I would like to ask. Not to persuade and not to convert and, you know, it, more than anything, it's just <laughs> the more we understand the people who don't see the world the same as us, um, it, it just, we've been locked into trying to prove each other wrong for so long. And, um, So this is just a great example of how differently that passage I just read could be read by believers and non-believers. Next quote is, the self which, had he become Caesar, would have been to him a sheer delight, though in another sense equally in despair. This self is now absolutely intolerable to him. So I think the idea here is I think the basic idea, and I think it sort of goes back to that first quote that I read that's not from this book, but there's a self that you're supposed to become. That's what you were made for. And I think that if I'm reading this book right, I think the thing he sees playing with our if that is your destiny or if that is what you're here to do, a lot of us ignore it. Um, we could just be oblivious to it. Or we know on some level, but we're ignoring it. Um, and he brings up Caesar here because he's saying, if I'm reading this right, the idea is this individual sees Caesar and says, ooh, that's what I want to become. I have this destiny, but I want to reject that destiny because I like Caesar, and so I want to become Caesar instead. Um, but he can't become Caesar because that's not his destiny. And so that is, um, it's despair that he, when he realizes that he can't be what he aspired to be. There's some themes coming up in some of the other quotes, I'm, so I'm just going to move on to the next one. The self which he despairingly wills to be is a self which he is not. For to will to be that self which one truly is, is indeed the opposite of despair. What he really wills is to tear his self away from the power which constituted it. But notwithstanding all his despair, this is he is unable to do notwithstanding all the efforts of despair, that power is the stronger, and it compels him to be the self he does not will to be. So like I was just saying, there's like this first line here. You can despair because you want to be what you were not. And then conversely he says, um, if you can align yourself in such a way that you are actually wanting to be what you were created to become, he calls that the opposite of despair, which maybe you would say joy or contentment or satisfied or um, fulfilled or um, however you want to say it. But 
then he brings by the power he's talking about God. This is tricky too. Um, because if that's the reality, isn't it kind of hard to believe how easy it is for people who don't believe to just be completely oblivious to this, to not feel any pull of it at all? And the fact that <clears throat> even if you take it on and say, yes, I believe, it's not like you have this figured out. I mean, we can argue that we're being guided and, um, you know, by the Bible and by other believers and by teaching, um, but I think if we think about the people we know, it's precious few that I think we look at and we think that person is absolutely fulfilling their destiny. They're on the right path, they know who they are, and they're using all their talents to the best of their ability. him tying um, wanting to be that self or you know knowing who that is and then being able to pursue it and tying that with um, the power which is God and us not wanting to do that as attempting to tear ourselves away from him the next quote is so much is said about wasted lives, but only that man's life is wasted who lived on so deceived by the joys of life or by its sorrows that he never became eternally and decisively conscious of himself as spirit, as self, or what is the same thing, never became aware and in the deepest sense received an impression of the fact that there is a God and that he himself, his self, exists before this God, this gain of infinity which is never attained except through despair. I think this really speaks to maybe what I was just saying. Um, one of the reasons it's easy to have no concept of God and therefore no belief that he made you and he made you for a purpose. One of the ways that that's easy to be oblivious to that is just what's happening in life, deceived by the joys of life or by its sorrows. Um, at the very end, he hints at this. This gain of infinity, which is never attained except through despair. Obviously, that really sucks. I'm sure we would all like an easy, easier path. Um, but if that is the only path, um, then it does make sense why things in this life are as messed up as they are. Um, it's bad because that's part of what you have to go through. Next quote, the more consciousness, the more self. The more consciousness, the more will. And the more will, the more self. A man who has no will at all is no self. The more will he has, the more conscious of self he has also. It's really interesting. I mean, I guess personally it's convicting. Because you can see how important will is in this. the will to be what you were made to be and can you will 
or something like that when you don't really know what that is. I think we certainly know people like that. There are people who know exactly who they are and they're able to pursue that destiny with a strong will. And then there's a lot of us who have no will because we don't we don't know where to point that. Maybe some of us don't have any will. So that's very convicting. Next quote is However, a self, every instant it exists, is in process of becoming for the self. Let me start over. However, a self, every instant it exists, is in process of becoming for the self does not actually exist. It is only that which it is to become. Insofar as the self does not become itself, it is not its own self, but not to be one's own self is despair. So obviously he uses that word despair a lot. I think the title of the book is something like The Sickness Unto Death Is Not, um, you know, the sickness that kills you because everybody's going to die. People who are completely in tune with their destiny, who are doing what they're doing, we're doing what they're supposed to be doing at, um, in a masterly way. They're still going to die. So the sickness unto death is despair, I think is what I'm, he probably puts it more poetically than that, but it's the despair he keeps coming back to is this um, being out of touch with all of that reality if it is indeed a reality. <clears throat> the other thing I'll key on in on is the the self does not actually exist. It is only that which it is to become. And I think that's what's very frustrating for us too. If we were already what we were to become, we wouldn't have to be here. The being here is the we're here to go undergo that process, and that sucks, um, especially if we don't know what the uh, we don't know where to point ourselves. We don't know, you know, other than to endure it. We don't. Um, it's, it is often a very confusing thing. This is a short one. I might have to go out of memory here because so that might not be great. But the quote is In it, Infinitude's despair is therefore the fantastical, the limitless. And that's just a little snapshot of if I remember this passage right, I think what he's getting at is, you know, just like in that quote earlier where. We can get wrapped up in the trials and tribulations or um, pleasures and material comforts and all of the things that we can get entrapped in in this life. <sighs> That's a danger. But the other danger is um, you can get too stuck in infinity and then you, you're you not able to manifest anything. It's um, You're just sort of floating. Um, and you can get lost in it. Because infinity is so much more than we can comprehend. So you can literally be chasing things forever and never um, attaching. sense. 
Next quote is, but in spite of the fact that a man has become fantastic in this fashion, he may nevertheless, although most commonly it becomes manifest, be, per be, be perfectly well able to live on, to be a man as it seems, to occupy himself with temporal things, get married, beget children, win honor and esteem, and perhaps no one notices that in a deeper sense he lacks a self. About such a thing as that, not much fuss is made in the world. For self is the thing the world is least apt to inquire about, and the thing of all things the most dangerous for a man to let people notice that he has it. The greatest danger, that of losing one's own self, may pass off as quietly as if it were nothing. So it's a very... pointed idea that from a worldly perspective you can look successful in every sphere of your being you have a family you're, you have a successful career you're um, respected in the community you're Social life is full of friends, and you know you have health, and you know I think we get the picture. The fact that you can have all of those things, and in a deeper sense, you lack a self in this eternal standing before your Creator way. Hopefully that possibility is humbling to all of us. I also really like this idea of um, that that self, this deep eternal self we're talking about, that's something the world is least apt to inquire about. Um, and the thing of all things the most dangerous for a man to let people notice that he has it. And I guess the clearest example of that is um, the story of Jesus. Um, but obviously we're not at Jesus' level, nor will we ever be. But it does seem to be a bit of a warning, too, of... Um, Curtis Yervin always says, hide your power. Um, so I think there's something of that idea in this. Next quote is, by seeing multitude of men about it, by getting engaged in all sorts of worldly affairs, by becoming wise about th how things go in the world, such a man forgets himself, forgets what his name is in the divine understanding of it does not dare to believe in himself, finds it too venturesome a thing to be himself far easier and safer to be like the others, to become an, an imitation, a number, a cipher in the crowd. So it's somewhat, somewhat a similar idea, the previous quote, but it also adds in this idea that... Um, There's some draw to just be part of the crowd and how becoming a part of the crowd um, you're losing um, the self which obviously makes sense the more individual you are the less um, identity you will get from whatever crowd you're part of. And the more you're in a tight crowd, the more identity you get from that crowd, the less individual you're going to be. 
So this book definitely seems to be a challenge to um, to believe in himself. I guess to believe first of all, but I think he uses that word venture or venturesome a few times, and I that call to venture to actually pursue this thing. And by pursuing it, it's going to take you into the crowd or take you away from the crowd. But that's your calling. Next quote is, So it is too that in the eyes of the world it is dangerous to venture. And why? Because one may lose. But not to venture is shrewd, and yet by not venturing it is so dreadfully easy to lose that which it would be difficult to lose, even in the most venturesome venture. And in any case, never so easily, so completely, as if it were nothing, oneself. For if I have ventured amiss, very well then life helps me by its punishment. But if I have not ventured at all, who then helps me? And moreover, if by not venturing at all in the highest sense, and to venture in the highest sense is precisely to become conscious of oneself, I have gained all earthly advantages and lost and lose myself. What of that? So this is another one that is very challenging. Calling you to venture to go out and try and fail. It is dangerous to venture. And why? Because one may lose. And it can be shrewd to play it safe, to not do things that put you in a position where you might lose. But the danger of that, he says, is that um, it makes it easy to lose yourself. It's very challenging, convicting, let's say. He's also saying that for if I've ventured amiss, if I fail, I try and I fail. He says, then life helps me by its punishment. I think that's a very poetic way of people saying you learn more from your failures than from your successes. Um, but if you're not trying, if you're not putting yourself out there, then you're not getting that feedback from the world. Um, so that's very convicting as well. Next quote is, now if possibility outruns necessity, the self runs away from the self so that it has no necessity whereto it is bound to return. Then this is the despair of possibility. The self becomes an abstract possibility which tires itself out with floundering in the possible, but does not budge from the spot, nor get to any spot, for precisely the necessary is the spot. To become oneself is precisely a movement at the spot. To become is a movement from the spot, but to become oneself is a movement at the spot. I'm not sure if I understand that kind of goes back to what he was talking about, about the infinite, how you can get lost in the infinite. Getting lost in possibility. I won't say anything else about that. Next quote is, this is commonly... <coughs> 
this is commonly enough recognized in a way and in a way it is commonly affirmed but the decisive affirmation comes only when a man is brought to the utmost, utmost extremity so that humanly speaking no possibility exists then the question is whether he will be leave that for God all things are possible that is to say whether he will believe but this is completely the formula for losing one's mind or understanding to believe is precisely to lose one's understanding in order to win God this is challenging as well because if he's right here he's saying If you follow this process to its end, you're going to come to a place where, well, I'm repeating what he said, but you're going to come to a place where, humanly speaking, no possibility exists. And your only way to move on from that point, maybe say it this way, maybe you could get to that point, and I guess this would be a tragedy, if you get to that point and then you realize that you're you don't really believe you've progressed to a place where you see no possibility that you can move on and you have to give up go do something else um, admit that you're a failure whatever that would look like But what he seems to be saying is each one of our lives is going to bring us to that place. And this is when your faith is going to be called on because you're going to have to move forward believing that God, who you can't see, is going to create a possibility that you also cannot see. simple definition of faith is believing without seeing. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard, but if that's what we're called to do, then it seems like we have to continue to be aware of that and continue to be preparing ourselves for that. Last quote, at least that I've written down for this first part. The believer perceives and understands, humanly speaking, his destruction in what has befallen him and in what he has ventured, but he believes. Therefore, he does not succumb. He leaves it wholly to God how he is to be helped, but he believes that God, for God all things are possible. To believe in his own destruction is impossible. To understand that humanity in its own to understand that humanly it is his own destruction and then nevertheless to believe in the possibility is what is meant by faith. So I think that's just kind of a reiteration of what I was just saying and a lot from the previous quote. He does, if you notice, there seems to be a bit of a he keeps coming back to things and he keeps saying things over again slightly different and I think there's a lot of that and maybe if you're dealing with very complicated ideas like this that's the way to do it is to keep coming back and saying slightly different finding nuanced ways to sort of say the same thing repeat it in an effort to convey the idea Maybe that's what he's doing. These books are also translated, which um, creates its own problems. 
it's part of the reason that maybe they're they're kind of tough to read. But um, I said that our life. I think I used the word failure before. Here he goes. He says outright destruction. So he ventured and he lived and his life came to destruction. But he believes anyway. This also is much like the story of Job. And maybe Job didn't see a happy ending either, but he did, he was an example of someone who kept his faith. I think one of his quotes is, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's daunting to believe that this life is going to take us all to that place. And that's just part of it. And maybe we all have the fortitude. But then again, maybe it's not up to our fortitude or strength at all. So, I don't know if I'll do a part two of this. Um, obviously, kind of all over the place at this point, but this first part of the book is, um, I got a lot out of it. Like I said, as I've progressed, I Either I lost it or I didn't understand it. or um, So if I can figure it out, then there will be a part two. And if not, that's probably going to have to wait. So, as always, thank you for listening.